Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Longinusa, welcoming you to another edition of Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro. The show where industry leaders, golf professionals, and legends all come and discuss the great game we love so much. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our host to tell us who's next on the tee. Chris, take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming back and joining me on Next on the Tee. We know you have a lot of choices for shows and podcasts to listen to out there, and we really appreciate that you've chosen Next on the Tee to be one of them. We are brought to you by the great folks over at the French Lick Resort. There isn't a better place to stay and play anywhere on the planet. You'll see why I say that when you check them out online at FrenchLick.com. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and today I have a couple of great guys that I get to share with you for the next hour or so. Making a return visit with me this morning is one of America's best 100 club fitters, and that's Scott Felix. Uh, If you got a uh, a new set of clubs or a new driver, a wedge, a putter for the holidays, or you're snowed in this weekend and you're watching the guys playing out on the West Coast Swing and you're daydreaming about getting out on the course and you want new clubs, Scott is here to help us understand the importance of being properly fit so that we can get optimal performance from those clubs. Look, if you're going to plop down hundreds of dollars, let's make sure the club works best for you and so that it's your buddies that are reaching for their wallets at the end of the round instead of you. Scott is going to be here with me in just a few minutes. Following him, we'll get a return visit from one of my favorite guests and a member of my dream bison, and that's PGA Tour Pro and now broadcaster Paul Stankowski. We'll get Paul's thoughts on a topic gaining some steam out there, and that's the idea that tour players should be allowed to wear, at least wear shorts during practice rounds in the Pro-Ams. The European Tour is going to allow that. Plus, uh, we'll talk with Paul about his win back at the 97 Hawaii Sony Open and his memories from the Masters when he joins me a little bit later in this half hour. And, folks, if that doesn't get your blood pumping and warm you up, well, our friends over at Aroma Ridge sure can because they offer an array of the finest mountain-grown gourmet coffees that you are going to find anywhere. Check them out online at at aromaridge.com. Their secret is hand-selected beans from a variety of coffee-producing countries from around the world. They roast those beans to perfection by their very own roast master in small batches for an even cleaner roast. Their coffees are roasted specifically, actually specifically for you. And if you like a little flavor in your coffees, they have almost any flavor you can imagine. You can uh, you know, mix and match and you can create your very own flavor yourself. And not only are their coffees great, but they are fantastic people as well. You're not going to find a better tasting coffee or better people to work with anywhere on the planet. And right now, folks, they have a Valentine's Day special going on on their Wicked Jack's Rum Cake, Chocolate Rum Cake, Red Velvet Cake. Boy, you want to talk about 20 ounces of deliciousness, folks. Check out all of their great products online at aromaridge.com. Okay, next on the tee is brought to you today by our friends over at the French Lick Resort in French Lick, Indiana. Folks, you want to talk about a spectacular resort to both play golf and just to relax and enjoy yourself. Well, you're not going to find a better place anywhere than the French Lick Resort. Go to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself and why we say that. And right now, let's hear from a word from our friends over there. Now's the time to plan that golf getaway you've been dreaming about at French Lick Resort. We have new Golf Academy packages for 2016, guaranteed to take your game to the next level. Try our one-day Quick Fix Academy for golf emergencies. For more in-depth learning, try the Game Changer, designed to make you a better player. Our staff professionals are ready to work with you at French Lick Resort. Did you know there's only one place in the country that you can play courses designed by two members of the World Golf Hall of Fame on the same property? The Pete Dye and Donald Ross courses at French Lick Resort make us an ultimate golf destination for 2016. Check out the Ultimate Golf Package, the Hall of Fame Package, and other great offerings at FrenchLick.com. Let 2016 be that year you finally take your dream golf getaway at French Lick Resort. Play the courses champions play. Yeah, folks, I promise you, it is absolutely spectacular. I had the privilege of taking my family there last summer, and we are really looking forward to going back. The French Lick Resort needs to be on your list of places to stay and play. And oh, by the way, my friends, they also have a casino right there on the property as well. For more information and to book your stay, go to FrenchLick.com. 
I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Allen Edmonds, makers of top quality made in the USA shoes. Folks, the shoes of great leaders from the Oval Office to corner offices to stage and screen and promising cubicles all around the country are part of what make people successful. The right footwear is important on the carpets and the hardwood floors of our global economy. Get it right with made in the USA uh, quality and value from Allen Edmonds. Allen Edmonds is an American original. They've been making shoes right here in the U.S. in Wisconsin since 1922. They have a winter clearance sale going on right now, some styles up to 40% off. So check it out online at allenedmonds.com. And every week here on Next on the T, we like to kick off the show by saluting the brave men and women serving in every branch of our military. We want to thank all of you for the daily sacrifices that you and your families make so our our freedoms and liberties are protected. We also want to thank our veterans for all you've done with us over the years. It's through the strength of our military personnel that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Sean Cruz and the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It's such an honor for us to have Next on the T be a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. Also, I want to remind our veterans out there, be sure to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. It is a great site with news and articles and a wealth of information specifically geared towards our veterans that I'm sure you're going to find both interesting and beneficial. Please go to globalvoiceforveterans.org, check it out, and bookmark that site. All right, now back with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Scott Felix. Let me remind you about Scott's background. He has nearly 20 years of experience with club fitting and repair. He's been working with guys like Lauren Roberts, Casey Wittenberg, and our good friend Sean McKeel. Scott has been named one of America's top 100 club fitters by Golf Digest, and I learned after talking with Scott several months ago that you should never buy a set of golf clubs before going to see him because he's going to help you play way better than you thought you previously could, even if he doesn't change your swing. So check him out online as well. He's at, you can find him uh, at his website, felixclubworks.com, and it's an honor for me to have Scott back on the show with me. Hey, Scott, how have you been, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Uh, I'm really well, Scott. I, I, you know, I know you're, you're over there in, in Collierville, Tennessee, just outside of Memphis, and uh, I don't know if you, you recall, but I'm over here. In Atlanta, I woke up to a dusting of snow, currently watching it snow like crazy outside my window here, Scott. How's the weather over there for you guys? I know you, you know, at Memphis, just like Atlanta, not good with the snow removal equipment. Oh, not at all. We're not used to this. It's uh, Armageddon over here. If we get half an inch of snow, uh, can't get any food at the grocery store. It looks like a zoo the night before when they uh, put it on the news that we're going to have snow coming at all. Uh, but it ended up kind of went around us, so it's not that bad, just really cold, a uh, little light dusting, and uh, it snowed pretty much all day yesterday, but nothing stuck, so it's not too bad, just cold. It's probably about 20 degrees here right now. Yeah, I know the same goes on here. You know, I, got, I went into the grocery store last night, and uh, there were two half gallons of milk left on the shelves, and uh, and the bread aisle was decimated. I don't understand what it is about bread and milk, like you know, that we have to have that if it's going to snow and we're going to be stuck inside for it for a day or two. But clearly, there must be you know some some magical potion that comes together when you've got bread and milk in the house. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm thinking about all the things I need, bread and milk aren't at the top of the list. I talked to a buddy of mine and uh, who actually lives up in the, in the Northeast, and uh, I told him we were expecting some snow. I know they're they're looking at a blizzard coming up that way so uh, he said he was headed out to the grocery store i said uh, get bread and milk he's like i can live well uh, i can live snowed in without bread and milk what i can't live without is alcohol i'm on my way to the to, to the to the liquor store you kidding me <laughs> so no i did i, I did hope everybody up north that. stays safe that's exactly what i did on the uh, on the way home thursday night i was like i'm gonna go to the liquor store and uh, the liquor store was just as crazy as a, as a grocery store you almost couldn't get a parking <laughs> spot people are parking out on the street there's a line around the corner. They had four pass registers open. It was unbelievable. So, but yeah, um, you know, we never really get snowed in over here. If we do, it's maybe a day or two. But people buy groceries like they're going to be snowed in for two months. It's uh, it's hilarious. Yeah, I'm with you. I hope everyone stays safe though out there. Please stay off the roads if you can. Scott, um, for those of us who got new equipment for the holidays or we're planning on it for uh, when we can actually see green grass. 
again, talk about why it's so important for us to get fit for that equipment and how you can actually help us play better than we ever thought we could, even if we, we come to you with the exact same swing. Um, you know, that's where all the different um, brands come into play. Um, everybody needs something a little bit different. Some people need to hit the ball a little bit more to the left. Um, you know, it could be a lie issue, a length issue, a uh, grip size, a uh, head design issue. Um, but there's certain companies that hit the ball a little higher. Some companies have equipment that squares the face up a little faster and helps turn it over a little bit more uh, for the average player. Then you have some people that tend to draw it too much, and there's clubs out there that hit the ball a little flatter, less spin, uh, flatter, less spin, and more right. Uh, it's trying to f- figure out the combinations and the things that you need based on how you play the game of golf. Uh, not everybody can go into one mold and swing like a particular um, tour player. And uh, there's a lot of teachers that'll, that'll try to get everybody to swing a certain way. And uh, a lot of times you can't do that. Um, perfect example, you take Trevino, try to line him up square, and, and I think he would play terrible. But, um, you know, you go in there and you want to set up fundamentally – correct to an extent there's a gray area that you can play aiming a little left a little right and then kind of find out what your tendencies are and then uh, start kind of putting some different combinations together and showing them how the different combinations or variables when you kind of match them up based on what they do how it kind of maximizes and helps their tendencies and enhances what they do better and you know to that end scott getting fit for your clubs isn't just for I think I think a lot of folks have the have the, the misconception that you know hey it's getting fit is for the for the guys that have you know single digit handicaps or girls that have single digit handicaps for the better players if you will but that's that's really not the case right it, it's you know it's it's for the high handicappers as well as where as I th- as I recall our last conversation you were saying boy you know we can see a dramatic improvement for for the folks that are in the you know the teens 20s that sort of thing we actually see the greatest improvement for for those folks is that right exactly right those are the ones the fittings that i have that are the most fun is when i have a couple guys that come down and they get fit back to back and one guy watches his buddy get fit and then vice versa and they just shake their head they're like that's unbelievable that things can change that much just by adjusting a few variables and matching it up um, a good friend of mine, uh, top 100 teacher, uh, he tells all his students, "Is you're not good enough not to get fit. Um, so you could take a tour player and I could give him things that are a little off here and there, and they can figure out and manipulate things to make it work to do what they want it to do. Where the average person is trying to do something that they can't repeat in general and 99% of the times don't have clubs that will actually help them try to achieve where they're trying to go in the first place. It's actually doing the opposite thing. So they don't know if it's the clubs or if it's them or if they lined up left or lined up right or the club face was right or what was going on. And then it just becomes Pandora's box trying to figure out what's going on. And then they get into, you know, different thoughts and it's just downhill from there. Yeah, no. And I love that. I love that saying you're not, you're not good enough not to get fit. That's a great way to put it. I'm going to keep that. And Scott, for for those of us who don't quite understand all of the jargon around irons and picking out the right style of iron for us, I mean, we hear about blades, cavity back, offset, all that sort of stuff. How do we know what the best type of club face actually is the best one for us? So if I had to just generalize things, um, the first thing I do when people come in is I really want to find out what their objective and what their goals are and what they're looking to end up doing at the end of the session, where are they really trying to go. Um, I'll assess what they have currently and find out what the issues are and what they would like to try to do better. And then from there, say I take a particular player and they're struggling hitting the ball a little bit higher. You know, they can't hit the ball high enough. It's just kind of a little low and flat shots. I would probably, the first club I would show them right off the bat would be a ping majority of pings tend to launch the ball a little higher. I don't CG locations and different things, but from 20 years of just working, fitting and things like that, ping just tends to launch the ball a little higher. If people hit the ball a little too high, you know, there are certain companies that I would pick up that would, there's a Callaway Apex 
not the Apex Pro, but the regular Apex tends to flatten the ball flight out a little bit, and I would match up a certain shaft and make sure that the link's right and um, try to match up exactly what they need from there. But there's certain companies, uh, say that there's six or seven different companies that I'm, I'm working with at a time, uh, depending on what they need, maybe half of those companies, the drawers might open up to where I actually pick something out of those particular categories for somebody that they wouldn't even fit into the other half of stuff. So it kind of already eliminates half of the product that I have. Uh, and that's what gets me going uh, in the right direction faster and just showing them and seeing what's going on there. And Scott, when, when we go to pick out the new driver, I mean, we see, you know, ads all the time. Everyone's got, you know, their, their drivers, you know, hit, hits the ball further and, you know, one's further than the other and et cetera, et cetera. They come in, you know, a lot of different lofts. So how, how do I know and how do you help me know you know, should I be using a nine degree, you know, driver, a twelve degree driver? How do you go about picking out, you know, the the proper law for you know my launch angle and how I hit the ball? So what I do there is when I have a player in there, I'll take some shots off their current driver and see what they're doing. What I'm looking for is a max height and what their land angle and spin rate is based on the speed that they have. Um, a good way to think about it is if you had a water hose that was a hundred percent on and a water hose that was half on you would hold those water hoses at two different angles to maximize not only the carry but the the way it splashes forward to get the maximum amount of distance with that water pressure but if you took the 50 percent and raised it to where you would have the one that was all the way on well it would just fall out of the air and not go anywhere and same thing with the hundred percent if you lowered it too much it wouldn't carry as far and it wouldn't really go as far because you're not maximizing those angles. So I'm, I'm looking at the max height, how it's coming out of the air. I like around 34 to 38 degrees, a land angle. That means the ball's coming out the air at a correct angle to where when it lands, it's going to go forward and not try to stop. Um, but that really varies from person to person based on the speed. It's all based on speed. So PGA tour average, the max height of a driver is around 96 feet and coming out of there around 38 with the correct spin and their average spins around 26. But you take a LPGA tour player, their club head speed is 96 miles an hour, which is a lot different than a PGA, which is 113. Their max height is 75. So it's dramatically flatter for them to sit there and be able to get the max carry and run based on their speed. Um, so going back to saying ping again, ping has three different drivers. They have a square face technology. It's called the SF tech for people that need to square the face up a little faster that need help turning the ball over a little bit better. They have the standard, uh, G series driver that's out now that comes in several different loss. Uh, and then they have a, uh, LS tech driver, which is a low spin driver. So based on those three, we can manipulate the variables where we're making it more open, more closed, more loft, less loft, changing the CG to really fine-tune and dial those numbers in to get the height, the spin, and the landing all right. And then from there, as you're kind of finding the right direction to go, you can start mixing and matching different shafts to see which one loads the best based on how they swing it. And, you know, Scott, you talked about, you know, launch angles and spins and i know I, I was testing some new drivers at my local pga tour superstore here recently and their fitters were saying that optimally the spin rate of the driver should be you know three thousand revolutions tour players or closer to two thousand maybe even less um, and no matter which brand of driver or which loft or shaft i tried i was always around four thousand what does that mean and why is it bad as the ball spins um air deflects out of the dimples, which creates lift. And if it's spinning too much, it's spinning to an apex, and once it spins to that apex, it's running out of speed. And as it runs out of speed, it just falls. So your land angle is going to be dramatically steeper. Your spin rate being at 4,000 is way too high because once it slows down, it's falling straight down, and basically your ball is trying to back up instead of bound forward. And that's what's wrong with that. So it could be several reasons. The driver could be too long and you're struggling hitting it in the face correctly. Um, a lot of people out on tour, on the PGA Tour, play 
45 and under, and most drivers that are on the shelf uh, for the average consumer is 45 inches and a quarter, 45 and a half, and 46. And it's all all uh, related or geared around distance. But that's not what always creates distance. The more you can hit it in the center of the face with the right spin, you can actually swing something shorter a little faster, be more consistent with the, uh, the hits, and have better uh, spin numbers and land numbers. So and you also talked about lie angles a minute ago, Scott. Talk about making sure that you have the actual correct lie angle and the impact that that lie angle can have if, you know, if you're too upright or you're too flat. You know, lie angle is very important. It's how the sole is going through the turf. And if you have the toe of the golf club too high off the ground as it's going through the turf, the heel is catching, which is going to force the face shut faster than sometimes most people want and can get the ball going left, starting left, and then continually go left. If the lie is too flat and the toe's digging too much, it can never let that toe square up or the face square up to the target, and it'll drag and hold the face open and tend to leave the ball more out to the right. So having the correct lie angle, um, not only the length, but the lie angle is really, really important for every golfer every golfer, um, even the best golfers in the world, if the golf club gets too flat and they struggle trying to hit the shot shape that they're used to and the ball hangs on them, it's due to lie angle once all the other variables are dialed in. And they they check those things pretty regularly every couple weeks, once a month at least, making sure that they didn't get out of whack traveling through play, practice, and things like that. And, Scott, I I think one thing that people don't give enough consideration to regarding their clubs is is the grip, the thickness of the grip. I know I I picked up a customized ping driver that had a pretty thick grip on it, and I thought, boy, this feels pretty good. I kind of like this. Is is grip really just a comfort thing? Because in the back of my mind, when I think about a thicker grip, I'm I'm a little worried that, you know, I might not be able to square, you know, the club face up enough or I might, you know, might slip one way or another if the grip is thicker. But what what are your thoughts on grip size? Grip size, you want to get your hand measured and find out what grip fits your hand because you want to hold on to the grip with very light grip pressure but still have control of the golf club. If you tend to squeeze too much because the grip is too small, you can actually hinder yourself from releasing the club properly then as well just because the grip is too small. And, um, you're squeezing to hold on to it because if you held it correctly, you would feel like you're actually going to throw it down the fairway is what the feeling is going to feel like. But like you mentioned a second ago, you can also have them too big. It can help, you know, hurt you and that you can't square the face up as well. The one thing that you see a lot of in multi-compound uh, M plus four, the new grip by Golf Pride has done a great job. And we do this a lot out on tour uh, is building up the bottom hand. There's a lot of the guys out there, uh, that choke down a lot, hit half shots, field shots, um, around the green, flighted shots. And so they kind of take the taper out of the bottom part of the hand. Um, so it gets built up a little bit. And especially you'll see that it's been done forever with wedges. You're not always on the very end of the golf club when you're chipping balls around the green. You're choking down or hitting specialty shots. You know, get that right hand built up, take some of that taper out of it. That way you can hold on to it and you don't feel like you're just holding on to the shaft. A couple of weeks ago, Scott, our our mutual friend uh, Sean McKeel and I were talking about grips, and he talked about grips that have a ridge that run along the bottom of the grip. Is that something you've seen folks use and be successful with? There's a lot of guys that use rib grips. You don't see them as common anymore. I think it's due to... Uh, people not being able to put them on square in in the local shops and uh, pro shops and things like that. Uh, there's a couple grips that you can get still that are ribbed. you got to make sure that whoever puts them on puts them on squarely. Um, it's, it's a rib grip, and it just it, a lot of people that use it love it, and it's almost like a safety blanket where you can just, when you hold on to it, it locks your hands in a particular place position and it's just a comfort thing and once you're used to it it's kind of hard to go back to a round because you kind of feel lost because you don't have that ridge right there that you know when it's in the right spot everything is where it's supposed to be so you've got guys that are ribbed that struggle going around and um, 
but every player is so different in what they want. You know, talking about Lauren Roberts, he he plays just starter tape when I put his grips on, and he likes them a little bit thinner. Sean plays a little bit thinner grip, but definitely likes rib grips. And he'll go back and forth from going rib to round, and he'll try round for a couple of days and, you know, go right back to rib. I don't know why he, he wants to change every once in a while just to try because I know he's going to be right back in a couple of days and putting rib right back on. Uh, Casey plays ribbed. Um, uh, just about all my guys around here played ribbed. And they, they just love it. It's just a security of knowing when you lock that golf club in your hand, the face is pointing in the correct position when you're at address. We are talking to America's one of America's top 100 club fitters, uh, Scott Felix, here on Next on the Tee. Scott, a couple of more uh, before we let you go. One of the clubs that, that has loft that not many of us are aware that does have loft is the putter. You know, I typically, you know, see or read about, you know, putters having, you know, somewhere three to four degrees of loft. So, you know, and, and, and it's, it's not unlike other clubs that we can see what the loft of that club is typically right on the right on the club itself. Putters don't show us what kind of loft they have on it. So I guess a couple of questions. Why do why do putters have loft? Because we don't want to get the ball airborne once it's on on the putting green. And what do we need to do to make sure that we are getting good roll out of our putter so that it's not skipping along the ground for the first couple of feet? Well, having the correct loft on a putter based on what you do um, is key. You know, they come two to four degrees depending on if it has uh, groove inserts. Uh, more of the groove inserts have less loft. Um, other putters standard typically have about four, but what loft does on a putter is get the ball out of its depression and gets it rolling. How you get it rolling the quickest or the best based on what you do could be ball position, could be hands need to be a little bit more forward. You kind of want to de-loft the putter as it's coming through because as you're actually making impact with the ball, your putter is actually swinging up. So you have to have a little forward shaft lane as that putter is coming up to almost put top spin like a tennis ball. You, you know, you're actually hitting up and having that toe roll over a little bit to get that ball up and out of its depression and get it rolling as soon as possible, and that's what's going to create the truest roll. You don't want to hit down on it too much with not enough loft because then you tend to make it skid and then roll, and then if you have too much loft, you can actually chip it, and that's going to, you know, you really need to figure out what putter and what type of loft gets you squarest of the hole, gets the ball rolling the soonest is, is the biggest key, is how fast can you get that ball rolling. And it could just be moving the ball back a little bit, making sure that you get the putter with two degrees of loft on it. Or if you play the putter too far back, you might want to add a little bit more loft on it. Um, it there's a lot of things to putters that most people don't go get fit for, and that's toe hang, which is a whole other day for a whole other subject there, and uh, <laughs> length, making sure that your eyes are over the golf ball correctly so you can see the line. And, Scott, one more uh, before we let you go. And we, we've obviously talked throughout this about getting fit for your clubs, but it, it's also important to make sure you're, you're using the right ball. Do you help guys figure out what the right ball fit is for them as well? Yes. And it's just everybody, you really, when you want to get fit for a ball, you really want to figure out how you play around the greens and go backwards. Um, you know, some people like to throw the ball past the hole, spin it back. Some people like to – have the ball one hop and stop. Some people are kind of chippers and runners. It just depends on how they like to play. Um, and even the feel. Some people like softer feels, firmer feels. Um, but from there, you can really dial that in, showing them based on a particular driver and the CG and the way it is, they can play that Tyler's Pro V1. Or for you, if you have good club head speed and you tend to spin the ball a little too much and we get you dialed in, you might be recommended more hitting a Pro V1X just to reduce the spin a little bit when you are a little off. So, you know, tendencies when you're getting fit is when you're playing good, it's great, but when you're playing bad, it's decent. So when you get all the different variables dialed in, if you're a little off, it'll still help you in all those little different scenarios that you have. So we're looking at either retaining spin, you know, if a guy has trouble holding the ball on the green, well, why do they have trouble holding the ball on the green? Uh, they don't have enough speed. Um, or they tend to spin it too much, they have too much speed, they hit down on it too much. So 
based on what their tendencies are, how they like to play, how they see those shots, you can guide somebody in the right direction for what kind of golf ball will fit them uh, to maximize their their shot shapes. That's great stuff. Scott, you know, thank you so much for, for uh, helping us better understand why we need to get fit and how to get fit. Um, for our listeners that want to reach out to you, whether that's you know over on your website, through social media, get more information and to book some time with you, how can they find you? They can find me at felixclubworks.com is the easiest way. Shoot me an email, uh, give me contact information, and I'll give you a call and uh, set up a time and get you, get you figured out. That's fantastic. Scott, thank you so much for joining me again this morning. Your knowledge of club fitting and the swing is absolutely amazing. I hope you'll come back and, and share some more of your thoughts and your insights with us and, and, and remind us periodically about why it's important for us to get, you know, not only to get clubs, but to make sure the clubs are fit for us because uh, you're fantastic. I really enjoy the opportunity to spend some time with you. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, Scott. All the best to you and your family, my friend. You too. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. That is Scott Felix, top 100 club fitter. And, again, his site is felixclubworks.com, F-E-L-I-X, felixclubworks.com. Great stuff. All right, I've got my next guest, Paul Stankowski, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Paul on the other side of this station identification. You're listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, heard around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Now back with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is one of my favorite all-time guests, PGA Tour Pro and broadcaster Paul Stankowski. Let me remind you about his background. Paul's from Oxnard, California, started playing golf at the age of eight. He attended the University of Texas at El Paso, where he was a three-time All-American and won the Western Athletic Conference Championship back in 1990, turned pro in 91, his first pro victory came on what's now the web.com tour at the 1996 Nike Louisiana Open. He backed that up by winning the very next week at the PGA Tour uh, Bell South Classic, becoming the only golfer in history to go from what was then the nationwide tour to the PGA Tour and winning in back-to-back weeks. In all, Paul has seven professional victories and 31 top 10 finishes, and I always have such a great time when he is with me next on the tee. Good morning, Paul. Thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Good morning, Chris. How are you doing, man? Uh, I'm fantastic. As I was saying to Scott, I'm, I'm looking out my window here, Paul. I got about an inch of snow on the ground, and it's snowing like crazy in Atlanta. And I think you know the city has about three shovels that can uh, get uh, get snow off the uh, off the streets. So uh, we're uh, we're we're essentially snowed in with an inch of snow on the ground. Yeah, that's crazy. The uh, that, that storm is it looks awful. And I was in D.C. last week. Um, doing Sirius XM and, and uh, for the PJ Tour Network, and I'm so glad I'm not there this week. <laughs> they're, they're locked, they're locked <laughs> down. But, you know, I'm in Dallas where I live, and it's 34 right now and, and cloudy and awful. I, I'm so sick and tired of, of winter. I want uh, I want some warm weather. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think, you know, so everyone around the country, as they prepare for what's supposed to be this blizzard, particularly up and down the uh, the northeast coast, I think everyone, as as we look and, and you know, as we watch on TV, right? As we watch the tournaments on TV, as they've you know been to Hawaii, and now they're on the West Coast swing, and you, you see guys out there in, in in the short sleeve shirts and the green grass. I think we're all jonesing for a little spring. Absolutely, it's the big tease, is what it is. You know, it was easy when I was playing because um, I was in Hawaii and I was in Palm Desert and I was in Phoenix, and and uh, but now that I'm not anymore, and, and I'm not in those, it really does stink. And, and uh, I am jonesing for some uh, some warmer weather to wear shorts again, some grass that's actually green, and uh, instead of dormant. And yeah, I, I bring it on. There you go. So, Paul, before we get into all the things around the tour, I'm always curious to you know see how your son Josh is doing. I remember when we spoke last fall, he had he broke 80 for the first time. How's Josh's game coming? You know, Josh is, uh, he is working on the right things. And I've been, um, all I'm trying to do for him is, is encourage him to think about the long term, it's the process. And uh, he, he has started working with Steve Johnson here in Dallas, who uh, he's the, uh, Hank Haney's partner uh, at uh, Hank's uh, place here in, in Louisville. And so Steve's been in the business for a long time. It's been Hank's right-hand man. And um, 
really working on just trying to get Josh to, to strike the ball in the same spot every time. And um, two years ago, Josh was uh, a better ball striker than he is now, and, and mainly because two years ago he was five foot one, and now he's 5'10". Uh, well, actually, two years ago wow. he's less than five foot. So he's grown a bunch. He's 5'10 and weighs 110 pounds. Um, so he is he is one gangly. He looks like minute bowl on the golf course, but uh, he he doesn't. Uh, so his coordination uh, with the golf club is is suffered. And so um, two months ago, before we started working with Steve, it was you know he could hit five shots, and it could one could be a fat fat pull, one could be a fat push, um, one could be a thin hook, one could be a thin slice. You know, one might be solid and straight. So. Now we've eliminated the rights and majority of the fats, and but now his balls are, are either solid, thin, but they're all starting left and hooking. So we're um, he's got a lesson at one o'clock today, and and we're going to address his grip. And um, when I say we, I I'm a standby. I just watch. But um, you know, I just try to encourage Josh that don't worry about your score. Um, he's got a tournament on Wednesday, and and he wants to play well. He's going to play against some of the varsity guys. And, uh, he's on the JV. It is, uh, and I said, Josh, don't, you're going to shoot somewhere between 80 and 100, um, and probably going to be somewhere between 90 and 100. So, who cares? Uh, you know, if, if, just think long term. Don't think of this tournament. So, um, I'm just trying to get him to think more more than just right now. You know, we want instant gratification when we take a lesson. We want to, you know, we fiddle with stuff and then we go out and we want it to be perfect. And if it doesn't, we go fiddle some more. And, and, um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in the process, and it takes time to to make things right. And uh, he's working on the right things. It looks good swing-wise. We've got his footwork working better, uh, more stability downstairs. And, uh, and so I'm excited for him long term. I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping he can he could uh, dial into that the mindset that, you know what, every shot, no matter what just happened, what do I got here? You know, and if they right. continue to just keep thinking of what do I got here, uh, and not worry about what just happened and uh, how many balls he's pull hooked in a row. Um, it's like, let's work on what do I have here, and let's continue to try and strike the ball, ball first, ball first, ball first. Yeah, and, you know, like we say all the time, right, uh, the most important shot in golf is the next one. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I learned a lesson back in 1996, and I think I've told the story before with Tiger Woods inter- being interviewed by uh, Curtis Strange, and and uh, you know Tiger's response to Cur- uh, Curtis's question about you know this is the biggest day of your life and yada 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 and you're on the first tee you know all the stuff kind of built it up. He said, "What were you thinking about? What was going through your head?" And Tiger said, without blinking, where I wanted the ball to go. And you know that right there was such maturity for a 20 year old guy coming out of college um, that you know anybody who listened to that interview. Uh, should have learned a lot about that because it's, you know, right. there are so many times we are distracted all the time in golf, and especially if you're playing in a tournament, whether it's the club championship or, you know, a, a $20 Nassau and you're on the last hole, um, you're going to be distracted by something. And so our job as golfers is to focus on this. I mean, I think our job as humans is to focus on right now. What have I got right now? Right now you're right. doing this interview and right now I'm, I'm doing this, but, um, you know, that's the thing, and whether we're, you know, plumbers or doctors or, you know, golfers or whatever, we got to forget what's in the past and focus on right now. What do we got? Yeah, that's great advice. And, and Paul, uh, you talk about distracted and, and things that are nerve-wracking. You're a big Alabama football fan. How nerve-wracking was the national championship game for you? Every game is nerve-wracking for me. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I, uh, I am a sports panicker. I mean, I if my team is in a game, I'm nervous for them. I, I'm, I'm always thinking there's no way they can win this game. And, you know, I'm hoping. And, you know, when the year started, when the season started, I thought there's no chance they're going to win a national championship this year. I didn't think Coker had um, uh, the the depth. Yeah, I knew their defense was going to be good. Nobody knew how good it was going to be. But – Coker stepped up, man, and he, he – that dude, from an offensive standpoint, he, he was a game changer. Now, obviously, their defense um, was just wicked good <laughs> and their special teams. And, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I didn't see the Michigan State game coming. I didn't see that 
what is it, 38 nothing or 35 nothing, and um, Clemson worried the heck out of me. I, uh, you know, I'm, but I'm always worried. I don't care if it's my Stars or Rangers or Mavericks or Cowboys or Alabama or my son next week. Or um, I never worried about me because I because I had I felt like I had a little bit of control. But when it, when I don't have any control, man, I just panic. But that's what <laughs> makes it fun. And uh, Paul, you know, talking about Alabama defense, uh, we had the uh, the pleasure of uh, having uh, Alabama legend Barry Krause on with us this past Thursday night on our football show, Thursday Night Tailgate. And you you may recall he was credited with uh, stopping Penn State running back Mike Gooman on a uh, fourth and goal from the one-foot line to help uh, Alabama win the national championship game back in 1978. Perhaps the most famous play, if if not only in Alabama history, perhaps in all college football history, so it was great to have the opportunity to talk with him about that experience and uh, what it was like for him to play for Bear Bryant. And uh, he, he shared with us that he was actually knocked unconscious on that play and got a neck stinger so bad that he was temporarily unable to move his extremities. He laid on the field after after making that hit for a while until the stinger sort of relaxed a little bit and he was able to get up and, uh, and jog off the field. But uh, it's uh, always an honor when you have an opportunity to talk to a guy like that. No, that's cool. I'm sure that was that was sweet. I wish I I had heard it. It, you know, one the sport is violent and it's hard to watch at times. And, and it seems like guys are so much bigger, stronger, faster now, and uh, the the collisions are are that much more um, intense. Um, which is makes me very thankful that I play golf um, for a living. <laughs> but uh, you know, I I love you know you think about that play and and you know the whole game, the whole season, all came down to one play and and he did his job and and that's what I love about Nick Saban I you know I I didn't we didn't have social media and in, in the in the the media coverage uh back in the in the 70s and early 80s like we do now and so um you know the Bear Bryant although I watched him uh, as a young kid um you know I didn't know the details and and so now but I, I you know now with media you know Nick Saban's on all the time and I love coach i don't know i've never met him personally i don't know a thing about his personal life all i know is as a coach he's he's really good and he gets his players to buy into the process and they buy into right. the fact that if they individually if each one of those guys do their job they're going to win the national championship and they believe it and so to a man all they're focused on is their job so when their their teammate messes up they're not ripping him and dogging him to to a uh uh, maybe they are for a short period of time, as everybody does. But but they all they all believe. You know what? It's my. It's there's accountability there. That it's my job. I got to do my job. And and if a guy's doing something stupid, they will get on him. Like do your dang job, or we're and we're going to do this. So they believe in that. And and I think that carries over to everything. That if we can believe, there's the process again. That it's it's all about the process. The most important part. The dream is awesome. It's great to dream to want to be the best of anything. To be the best golfer, radio personality interviewer, uh, plumber, cook, okay? It's great to dream. And you got to write that dream down, pin it on your wall, and then walk away from it and go and do the things that it takes to get to that dream. And so in the end, the most important part wasn't really the dream. It was the doing. It was the work. It was the, the drive. It was all that stuff that it took to get there, which I think is more important than just thinking about it. You know, you, I can think about eating tacos on Taco Tuesday, uh, but until I go to the store and buy the meat and seasonings and the onions and the tortillas and the and the oil to cook it all in, um, I'm not going to have tacos. You know, I can dream about it and sit there and salivate and go, man, this is going to be great tacos. But I still got to go buy the stuff and make it. So <laughs> to me, the most important part of Taco Tuesday is going and getting the ingredients and putting it all together. And then, then you get the pleasure of eating it at the end. And and uh, so I'm a process guy and I love I love that. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, Coach Bear Bryant was uh, was the same. And it's interesting that you talk about that because, you know, uh, Nick Saban and Bill Belichick have a relationship, and I know they spend time together. And, and Belichick's thing is, you know, do your job. Right? I got a T-shirt that's got Belichick on it with do your job, right? And, that's, yep. and that is the secret. If, if all, you know, 53 men on, a, on, a, you know, on an NFL roster, but if everyone is coached and they do their job, to the best of their ability and how they've been coached to do it, to your point, you know, with the whether it's the Patriots or Alabama, the guys are going to win. They know they're going to win. If you do your job and I do my job and we do it to the best of our ability and how we've been coached to do it, we're going to win this game. 
And that's why Alabama's won, you know, four national championships now in the last seven years. That's why the Patriots and Tom Brady are about to play in, you know, Brady and Belichick's 10th AFC championship game and are going to play for another, potentially for another Super Bowl. But if all those guys buy in and they all do their job, they're going to be collectively, they're going to be successful. So I think that's a, that's a great lesson, you know, for all of us to pay attention to. Absolutely. And the thing is, is that even if they don't win, they can look at themselves and hold their head up high and say, you know, we did our job. And, and it's just, it's sport. You know, I believe, I believe Peyton Manning is going to step up and, and win one and get to the Super Bowl and go out in style. Um, that, that's what I'm hoping for. But I, but I, at the same time, that whole process thing, I love that. Do your job. That that's, it's brilliant. In this day and age where it seems like everybody is pointing fingers at everybody else and nobody wants to take responsibility for their own actions and everybody wants something for nothing, it drives me crazy. Um, but you know what? There are still some people out there that, that teach it right, and there are some people out there that, that pay attention and, and do their jobs. Uh, we've been we've been chatting for about 15 minutes. Maybe it's time for us to talk. Let's talk a little golf. So, oh, yeah, golf. <laughs> What what are the things, Paul? That's uh, starting to to get into the news. Interested to get your reaction to it is the idea that uh, the players can wear shorts out there now. I mean, you know, the European Tour I think is granted the guys the opportunity to wear shorts and in, in pro ams. You know, is has the day come for for the PGA Tour to allow guys to wear shorts? You know, I, as much as I think that that would be awesome, and, and I've been a proponent for years. Uh, to allow us to wear shorts. I, I've, uh, I don't think Fincham will ever do it. And so I don't, I think as long as Tim Fincham and he could surprise us all, but I think as long as he's our commissioner, um, I don't see that happening, but, uh, I wish it would. Um, because I, have you seen some of the guys out there in, in, uh, you know, tan khakis in the sweating through their pants, right? It, it, it looks awful. Right. So it's, the whole idea is that pants make it look more professional. Well, it's like to a point, but then it's like, you know, when the guy's sweating, butt sweat, knee sweat, ankle sweat all <laughs> over the place and his pants are just soaked, it looks terrible and it's uncomfortable. And, you know, you got to be able to move well and, you know, but anyway, there's, there's good fabrics now that, that uh, companies are using to, to make pants more breathable, you know, add a little flex to them so that they're, when they stick to you, they, they actually move. Um, but I, I would love to see it. I think it would it would really it would be a story initially, and then it would just be the way it is. You know, uh, guys right. aren't going to wear super short shorts. They're not going to wear you know things that look bad. They're going to the guys don't want to look bad. They want to look good. And some guys will only wear pants anyway. Um, you know, I, I personally I like wearing pants. Uh, when I wear shorts, I, I I feel like well, I, I don't feel like I'm playing in a tournament. You know, so it would take I think it takes some getting used to because guys are, are accustomed to looking down at the ball, seeing their shoes, and seeing pants all the way down to their shoes. Um, and so when they're at home, they play in shorts. But uh, I kind of I wish it would. Um, it did for the caddies. It took a long time for the, for the tour to, right. to relent there and, and let them wear them, and I think that's been awesome. Um, and so maybe, it's, maybe it is time. And, and uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe that will be one of the, Tim's parting changes when he leaves someday. Right, and Paul, you you recently shared a picture of you at the uh, '97 uh, Sony Open on your on your Twitter account. One of your victories out on tour. You won that week in a playoff over Jim Furyk and Mike Reed. Uh, I'm sure every year when the when the Sony uh, Open is being played, that uh, brings back some great memories. I was just kind of interested to get your thoughts. What do you remember about that week? Well, that was uh, you know the funny thing about uh, Wild Eyes. I it didn't like me very much. Um, the golf course and Hawaii, uh, it's surprising that I won two tournaments in Hawaii. I won uh, the over at Kapalua the fall right before that in 96. Uh, it, it was our first silly season event of the season. Um, uh, and it was uh, called the Lincoln Mercury Kapalua International or something. And I, and I won there, and then I won a few months later at Wailai. And, and I'm a high cutter. Like I hit high cuts. That, that's, that was my bread and butter shot. I didn't know how to hit a ball low. I couldn't hit it. I couldn't hit it right to left. And so when you play in Hawaii and it's windy and you have a left to right wind, it's like the ball is sailing. So it wasn't really a golf course that suited my game. But it, in 1997, um, I drove it good enough 
and I hit it far enough, and I dominated the par fives, and and that was the answer. I think I shot 19 under for the week. I was 17 under on the par fives, and um, it was a par 72 at the time. And um, yeah, I know the greens are always fast. I mean, it's just a it's a fun golf course to play, um, but it, it wasn't one. I think I missed three straight cuts. I won. I made the cut the next year, but at the back of the pack, and then I missed more cuts. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I think I had. I know I've made like two cuts there in my whole career, but one of them was a W. And, and Paul, we we talk a lot about the the mental side of the game on this show, and and when you're playing a course like the ones out in Hawaii, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of water. To your point, you know, the wind is kicking up. How do you block out all sort all the negative thoughts about the water and the trouble and the wind is doing this or that and the other thing and all the trouble that you see with your eye? How do you block all of that out and just stay focused on the on on the target? Well, I mean, it, it you can't think of two things at one time clearly right so if you choose one thing to think about and that's what you what you're focusing on then everything else fades away okay i mean that's that you there's you can't think of a red apple and a yellow lemon and see them both perfectly clear right you can't um right you have to look you have to pick one so pick one and you know i i i'm a cutter you know i'd look down the the, the first fairway there at, at wile and you've got uh driving range on the left you got houses on the right uh, there's a bunker out there. The wind's whipping down. You know, I, I pick a target that I want the ball to land at, and I, I adjust my line based on the wind and my shape, and, and then I hit it. And so if I'm focusing on where I want the ball to land, what the wind's doing, where I need the ball to start to get the ball to land there, what trajectory, okay, I see all that stuff, then I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm thinking about my target. You know? and, and so it's really simple. Not easy, Chris, but it's simple. Focus on what you want to focus on, and mm-hmm. and that's it. So, um, you know that it's uh, now when the ball's not going where you want. Like, say, my shot was a, a normal high cut. Now, if I was hitting balls that were starting uh, left of my intended line and and actually drawing, okay, now I have no idea where to aim, right? Uh, because I'm thinking, right. well, I I can't aim right because I cut the ball. But even though the ball's drawing right now, my mind goes, what are you doing over there? You need to aim left, and so. Then there's the whole subconscious, conscious fight. Your, your conscious mind takes over it during your golf swing, which is bad news because it's supposed to be <laughs> reactionary. That's your subconscious. So all of a sudden, when you're over the ball and you aim it, and then you look up, you're like, nope, ain't right. And you move to the right, and you look up, you're like, well, too far right. And then you go, oh, gosh. And then all of a sudden, you swing, and, and instead of swinging a golf club, you're swinging a steering wheel, right? And you're like, oh, gosh, stay. And it, it <laughs> freaks you out. So it's a, uh, you know, it's easy when the ball's, when the ball's shaping and starting where you want it, it's, the game is simple because then all you got to do is point and click, um, like a rifle. You know, typically you tune your rifle up and you sight it in and you pull the trigger. It goes where where you're aiming, right? Because there's no other. Right. I mean, a, a bullet's going so fast. If, if the target's 100 yards away and the wind's blowing 10 miles an hour, it's not going to move that much. I mean, you can still hit your target. But a golf ball is different, you know. And and um, your golf swing isn't like shooting a gun. It's you know, it's got a ton of moving parts. And um, so that's where it's tough. And that's where the great players who um, can manage themselves around a golf course, uh, even when they're not starting the ball online properly, um, they still figure out a way to, to, to focus in and, and go, okay, what can I do? What what shot can I hit here? What what do I have? You know, if I don't have my high cut, what do I have? And then they trust it. And, and their objective there at that point is just to get the thing around as good as you possibly can, sign your car, go to the range, and try and fix it. You know? <laughs> I'm talking with PGA Tour Pro and member of the Sirius XM PGA Tour Channel's broadcasting team, Paul Stankowski. And, Paul, a couple more before we let you go. Um, when the calendar flips to a new year and, you know, golf fans, we, we, we start to, you know, take a look, you know, ahead to the Masters. We start to see the commercials playing on the, you know, on the tournaments that week. You had some good tournaments at Augusta National there in, in the late 90s. I'm curious, what was it like for you the very first time the uh, an invitation arrived in the mail to play in the Masters? Well, my invitation didn't come in the mail because I won the day before tournament week so i was i won the week before so my invitation i think came via fax uh to the atlanta is that right uh pro pro shop yeah i won in atlanta and uh the next day i was driving down magnolia lane so 
that was a uh, wow. That was a shocker. Um, but I, you know, as a kid, as a golfer, I mean, what what? There's really one event that we watch every single year that's at the same venue, and that's the Masters. You know, we all watch the U.S. Open, but it changes every year. We all watch the Open Championship, but it changes every year. The PGA changes every year. The Masters, it's the same. And, you know, as a kid, when I was a kid, they only showed the back nine. I mean, maybe maybe not even the entire back nine. And then they started adding some holes, and, and then now the, we get the benefit of seeing the whole thing. But So my first walk around Augusta, um, was mind boggling. So that's when it started for me. Like I say, literally the next day I'm driving down Magnolia Lane. I've got a kink in my neck because I woke up with, I couldn't move my head. Um, I must have eat too much pizza and did too much laundry the night before celebrating. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, so I couldn't even play a practice round that week, but I, I walked the golf course with my, my yardage book and my caddy and, um, just was taking it in and it really didn't sink in. I walked the front nine and there again, I hadn't seen much of the front nine. Uh, I played 10 and thought, wow, this is a big hill, and that's a huge double leg left. I got no chance on this hole um, because I'm a cutter. <laughs> and then I got to 11, and I tee, or I didn't tee off, but I'm, I'm walking to the top of the hill, and I get to the top of the hill, and I have my yardage book, and I'm looking down, and then I look up, and I see 11 green below me to the left, and then I look to the right, and I see 12 tee box and 12 green. And then I, at that point, I had a smile on my face, bigger than you could think, and I never looked down again. I just, like, stared. Like, this is unbelievable. This is it. This is the holy <laughs> grail of golf. And, and um, you know, walking 13 and that another big dog leg left. And I'm like, boy, how far left do I, and do I need to start this thing and uh, to keep it in the fairway? And um, it, it was incredible. But what a, what a joy and an honor and a thrill um, to have been able to, to live out a childhood dream of playing in the Masters. Um, and then that second year, I actually, you know, got in the, in the second to last group on Sunday. And, um, you know, I didn't, we didn't have a chance to win at that point. But, you know, I had a chance to finish second. That would have been pretty darn good. I know Tiger thought second sucked, but um, second would have been cool uh, <laughs> at the Masters, that's for <laughs> sure. But um, it, was, it, it was a dream. You know, I, I'm, and now looking back at it, Chris, it seems like that all that's all it was was a dream. It was so long ago, uh, ninety six or what did I play ninety six, seven and eight. Right. That it was hard. It's hard, even though I remember. It's still like wow. Was that did that really happen or was that really just a dream? Um, but it was. It, I went back two years ago with my son, and and uh, it was an emotional stroll um, for me. Just uh, yeah. Just as soon as I walked on property, I I, I got choked up and just great memories. Just so so thankful that you know i got to play um out there like i say when i was my son's age I, I it was a dream and i i wanted it didn't know what it what it was all about i just knew it would have been really cool to to play on the pga tour someday and and um you know i got to do it and and periodically i still get to play in them uh which is kind of neat and uh and and now when i play i feel like that kid again you know that like here it is this is cool and uh so very neat. I, I'm, I'm grateful for where I'm at this new season of life. Um, you know, on the other side of my career, and and uh, and it's fun to reminisce. And so it's, I, I enjoy I enjoy talking to you because you always seem to bring up the good memories, and, and it's kind of fun. But uh, you know, it, it's yeah, those those days are gone, and and the, the news coming. And speaking of the new, and, and you're and you're doing a lot of broadcasting work, like I say, with with Sirius X, Sirius XM and the PGA Tour channel. And, and when you're preparing for a broadcast, Paul, is is there a fine line that you're walking between, you know, still being one of the guys, but also trying to paint the picture for people listening in over the radio for what's actually happening out there? You know, I'm 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 going to be honest at all times, and and that's. Uh, I think you've realized that once you get me going, I just keep going sometimes. And, and um, I, doing analyst work, it, it, I don't have a whole lot of time to, to say what I want to say because it's so fast-paced. And um, I may have five to, to ten seconds to say something, and, and that's not enough time for me because <laughs> I like to ramble. <laughs> but um, I, I'm going to be honest, and I'll paint a picture. And if a guy hit a bad shot, I'm going to say that was a bad shot. You know, uh, If a guy hit a good shot, I'm going to say, wow, that was a good shot, especially if it was a hard one. Um, I'm just, I, I'm going to say it how it is. And, and, uh, I, I'm not going to be critical, you know, telling a guy or mentioning that this guy hit an awful golf shot. That's not critical. That's just fact. If he's in the middle of fairway with an eight iron and the pins in the back left and he misses the bunker left, 
that's a bad shot. That's a horrible shot. I mean, it could have been mental. It could have been physical. But it was a bad shot. Um, <laughs> and if he gets that thing up and down, I'm going to high five him and say that was a great up and down, you know. Um, but it is what it is. And, and so, uh, I, I'm like I say, I'm not going to shy away from, from that type of stuff. I won't, you know, if a guy's acting like a moron on the golf course, I may not say that on air. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I may – but I may say something to the fact that he needs to get his thoughts together, you know, because that's, it's just, it is, I, there's not enough time for me. I, I, you know, I wish I had more time, uh, but that would probably get me into trouble. And Paul, before we let you go, your company, Francis Edwards, sells amazing exotic leather goods, including some really cool belts, and nothing seems cooler out on tour right now than, uh, than a, a belt statement. So talk, update us on how things are going at Francis Edwards and uh, how folks can uh, check it out. You know we're we're doing okay. We're a small company, and and uh, but we're plugging along. Um, our website's francisedward.com. dot uh, com. You cannot buy from our website. We sell through pro shops around the country. Uh, but you can take a look, and and uh, if you're not near a vendor, uh, a club, if you're not a member of a club or near one that you could buy it, then just give us a shout. There's a phone number on there, and and you know we'll take your order. Um, we also have a, a website called shopfrancisedward.com. dot com. Uh, S-H-O-P, FrancisEdward.com, and that's where we'll sell some of our kind of overstock items. Um, we don't have a ton of inventory on there because we don't keep a ton of inventory, but when we do get some inventory via return or, or uh, uh, you know, if we had an event, we had some extras that we brought back, I'll throw them on the website. We sell them at a discount uh, just to move it. So um, if they check periodically, uh, you know, there's some cool-looking stuff going on there, and, and some are, some's already fitted, sized. You know, they might be a size 34 or 36. Some are, you know, 44-inch blanks, and we can cut them down to whatever size they want. So they're, uh, uh, I would check that site often because uh, there's some great deals. But otherwise, if you live in an area, uh, we're all over from California to Florida. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a, uh, a list of our clubs on our website, but just call us. The guy goes there and goes, where, where do I find it? Give us a call. We'll tell you where to go. And like I say, if, if you're not near it, if you're in a state we're not in, we'll, uh, we'll take your order. And remind our listeners uh, how they can follow you over social media as well, Paul. Um, I'm at, uh, at Paul Stankowski on Twitter. Um, and that's pretty much it. I, you know, I tweet. Our, we have a, our business has a website it's, uh, on, or a uh, Facebook page. It's Francis Edward USA. And then we have a Twitter page. It's at Francis Edward underscore. Uh, but, yeah, that's it. All right. Paul, thank you for, A, being so generous with your time and uh, and coming back on the show. It's, like I say, I always have so much fun when I get the opportunity to spend some time with you. And I thank you for everything that uh, that you share with our audience. And, uh, and, and mostly, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. I, I, I enjoy coming on with you. You're You're one of the best. Nah, thank you for saying that, and, and as are you. Paul, look forward to catching up with you uh, hopefully again uh, before too long. In the meantime, all the best to Josh pulling for him, and uh, you know, like I say, all the best for you and your family as well, my friend. Likewise, Chris. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Take care. That is PGA Tour Pro, and uh, you can also hear him on uh, Sirius XM's PGA channel broadcasting some events. Paul Stankowski. Folks, there isn't a, uh, a better person on the planet then Paul Stankowski really enjoyed the opportunity to uh, to get to speak with him and uh, hear him share his stories. He's a he's a, a wonderful broadcaster, a wonderful person, and he, he tells such great stories. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this episode. Before we close up shop, I want to remind you about our friend and uh, partner, uh, PGA Tour Pro Jim Estes, and the great folks over at the uh, Salute Military Golf Association. Let's uh, let's hear a word from our friends over there. The Salute Military Golf Association was created to provide rehabilitative golf experiences to the brave men and women who have been wounded while serving our country. Hi, I'm Jim Estes, PGA Golf Pro and co-founder of the Salute Military Golf Association. With my adaptive golf program, we've successfully helped thousands of soldiers in their recovery, both mentally and physically. The SMGA has been providing family-inclusive golf experiences across the country since 2007. To date, the SMGA has equipped more than 1,000 warriors with properly fitted golf clubs and has extended its clinic series to more than eight chapter and affiliate locations across the U.S., 
If you are a wounded veteran interested in participating or if you'd like to learn more about the Salute Military Golf Association and find a chapter closest to you, visit our website at smga.org. We've seen firsthand how impactful golf can be in aiding one's recovery. The Salute Military Golf Association, empowering wounded veterans one fairway at a time. Visit smga.org. That's smga.org. Yeah, they're doing some amazing things at the uh, Salute Military Golf Association. Please, to find out more information and see how you can get involved, go to smga.org. Uh, wonderful, uh, a wonderful organization and uh, great work that Jim and his team are doing together. All right, everybody, my sincere thanks to Scott Felix and Paul Stankowski for joining me uh, today and making today's show so much fun for me to be a part of. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Please also, like you heard me talk about with Paul, please check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host Bob Lazari. That show airs every Thursday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can hear it live on Blog Talk Radio. We're also on iHeartRadio, the Armed Forces Radio Network. You can find us on podcasting sites all over the Internet. That show, like this one, uh, is a, a great time for me to be a part of, and we get the opportunity on Thursday Night Tailgate to, to talk to legends. You heard me talk about Barry Krause. We get to talk uh, with legends from around the NFL and the CFL as well. We have typically anywhere from five to seven current or former players talking about their experiences and their stories from uh, being a part of uh, the NFL. So please, check out that show. You can find it online at ThursdayNightTailgate.com. You can find this show online at NextOnTheT.net. From either site, you can uh, stream or download any of our our archive episodes for free. Plus, you can keep up to date with who some of our future guests are going to be. Thank you again for choosing to listen to Next on the T today. We really appreciate it. We appreciate you guys the very most. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA legends, pros and top instructors, and media members go to tell their stories. Join us same time every Saturday to hear more stories about the game we love from the people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all about the great game of golf.